Previously, we shared how insights from your research can inform your goal statement and storyboards, which ultimately builds toward the wireframe deal design. In this video, we'll focus on organizing the information in your wireframe using what we call information architecture. Information architecture, or IA, organizes content to help users understand where they are in a product and where the information they want is. When users find a product easy to use, it means they can find what they're looking for quickly and intuitively. This isn't by chance, it's by design. To make sure your product is easy to use, your information architecture should be informed by many sources, like user research and the ways that existing products in the market are structured. Knowing the users, their goals, and their behaviors is key to effective IA. IA helps organize a site or an app. It's like a map. Here's an example of how IA might come to life. Notice how it's a bunch of lines and rectangles. The rectangle at the top might represent the home page because it's the page you want users to start on when they enter your website. Below the home page is a row of rectangles that are each attached to the home page by a line. This row of rectangles represents the different sections of your website. For example, if you're creating a sitemap for a shopping website, this row of rectangles could include products, cart, user account, and the shop's about page. Finally, each section has a column of rectangles attached to it by lines. This column of rectangles represents the subpages of that section. For example, the cart section of our shopping website might include subpages like order summary, shipping, and payment. Creating information architecture is an important part of UX design for many reasons. First and foremost, IA organizes and defines the overall structure for the app or the site. Second, it provides a high-level view of a product. As a UX designer, you need to understand how the elements of a product fit together and relate to each other in order to create the design of that product. Third, IA helps stakeholders review your designs. Stakeholders can evaluate whether the content in the site or app is the correct type of content and if it's placed in the appropriate places to help achieve business or product goals. Strong IA also helps engineers understand how to organize the data, so the eventual development of the product matches the visual designs you've created. So not only will your users benefit from good IA, it'll make your colleagues' jobs easier too. Finally, an information architecture that's flexible allows your ideas to grow and iterate with the design. The ability to adapt your approach at different stages of a project is one of a UX designer's most necessary skills. For example, you should group your information architecture in a way that allows you to add additional categories in the future. Once you've established your information architecture, you can use it to inform your wireframes. A stronger IA generally means clearer wireframes and a better thought out product overall. Put it this way, if you create a clear information architecture for the dog walking app, you'll have a better understanding of how the different screens in the app will fit together and how the user will move or navigate between those screens. This will help a lot when you start drawing wireframes. Now you know the basics of information architecture and how IA can inform your wireframes. Next, we'll explore how information architecture is visually represented through sitemaps. Meet me there. Earlier, you learned how to draw one frame of a wireframe on paper when you created your first wireframe of the Google Photos app. In this video, we're going to take your wireframing skills to the next level. Wireframing helps you get your ideas down. So it's time to draw wireframes for a new product. Let's go! Remember, a wireframe is a basic outline of a digital experience, like an app or website that's made up of lines and simple shapes. The goals of creating wireframes are to establish the basic structure of a page and to highlight the intended function of each element. We want to focus on the structure and function before visual elements like color or fonts are added to the mix. You may be wondering, why do we build wireframes on paper? 
Remember, we already covered the benefits to creating wireframes in general, so I'll quickly share a few benefits to paper wireframes in particular. First, paper wireframes are the fastest way to get your idea out. A simple drawing by hand is much faster than building a wireframe in a digital tool. Think about how quickly you could draw a few lines, squares, and circles on a napkin. Now that's speedy. Second, drawing on paper is inexpensive. After all, you only need a pen and paper. No fancy tools or software are required. In addition, because creating paper wireframes is fast and inexpensive, you can explore lots of ideas. Keep in mind that wireframes are not meant to be perfect. Instead, wireframes help you get all your ideas out on paper without worrying about every single detail. Later, we'll review those ideas and narrow our focus on the best parts of the wireframes we drew. Okay, there's one thing I should clarify. The example wireframes we presented earlier in Gmail and Google Photos were for products that already exist. This is a great way to practice wireframing because you have a real product to reference and try to replicate. But typically, we draw wireframes for a new product or new feature. To help us explore a lot of ideas, we may be creating multiple wireframes for the same screen of an app or website. Think about this example. Imagine we need to draw wireframes for the homepage of our dog walking app. The dog walking app doesn't exist in real life yet, so we're coming up with lots of ideas for the structure of the homepage and the intended function of each element on the homepage. In other words, you're drawing wireframes for lots of ways that one screen, the homepage, could work. Paper wireframes sound pretty great, right? So grab your thinking cap and let's get to it. Step one. Before we begin drawing, it's helpful to write a quick list of the information that needs to go on the page you're drawing wireframes for. It's important to list this information up front so you remember to draw all of the elements in each of your wireframes. We're drawing wireframes for the home page of our dog walking app, so the information that needs to be included on this page might include a navigation icon, a search bar, images, and text descriptions. Step two, start drawing. It's a good rule of thumb to try to create at least five different versions of how you want to structure information on a page. Remember, at this stage, our goal is to explore lots of ideas with our wireframes. For our example, I'll draw five wireframes of the home page for a dog walking app. As I draw, I'll check the list from step one to make sure I don't forget any elements. There's no right answer, so be creative and try new ideas. You might come up with what feels like a ridiculous layout, but that's how we come up with innovative ideas. Wow, that was fun. Let me share my thought process for each of the five wireframes I just drew. First, for option A, I drew a layout for the home page where each dog walker has their own profile card. I wanted each profile to look like a card because it reminded me of when dog walkers put up flyers at the grocery store. There's also a search bar at the top of the home page. For option B, I wanted more than just the dog walker's profiles on the homepage. I thought it might be helpful for users to have some tips or articles about how to train your dog at the top of the page. I also tried making the dog walker profiles horizontal rectangles instead of vertical rectangles like cards. For option C, I added an area to show the user's recent activity within the app. I thought this might be helpful for users who want to schedule the same dog walker multiple times. I like the horizontal dog walker profiles, so I drew them again, but this time I used dividers instead of rectangular shapes. I also added a header to describe the profiles as dog walkers near you. Next, for option D, I drew something totally different. That's part of the ideation process. I drew three large sections to highlight the most important features in the app. Schedule a dog walker, recent activities, and latest training tips. I thought this would help users easily navigate the app. Finally, for option E, I wanted the homepage to be more visually engaging, so I added a few placeholder images, which are the squares with an X in them. I also added an avatar in the top right corner to help users easily navigate to their profile page. All right, so now it's time for step three. We're done coming up with ideas, and it's time to refine the wireframe. Review the versions of the wireframe you came up with and add a star next to the pieces you like most. In our example, 
I drew a bar at the top holding the navigation menu in most of my explorations. That tells me I probably want to keep that content up there, so I'll add a star to that part of the wireframe. In addition, I really like showing the dog walkers near you in a list because it makes it easy for the users to quickly see as many new dog walker candidates as possible and find someone they like to hire. So I'm going to put a star next to that. And finally, step four. With attention on the best of your ideas, you can narrow down the parts of your wireframe that you want to explore further in a digital wireframe. It's helpful to pick two or three ideas to build out further using a digital design tool. We'll cover wireframing digitally in the next video. One more thing, it's helpful to refer to your sitemap to determine which pages you've already wireframed and which ones you still need to wireframe. You can also use your sitemap to chunk the project into smaller pieces. For example, if you were building wireframes from the shopping website sitemap, you might wireframe the home page, then each of the section pages. And finally, each column of subpages. Because wireframing is such an important part of the design process, you want to save your paper wireframes to include pictures of them in your portfolio. Each time you create paper wireframes, remember to take photos. So when you're ready to work on your portfolio piece, you have a bunch to choose from to include. Coming up, you'll learn how to use your favorite elements of your paper wireframes to build digital wireframes. We learned a lot about wireframing and why paper wireframes are a great starting point for your actual UX designs. By now, you should have created a pretty solid paper wireframe yourself. Be sure to hang on to your paper wireframes for your portfolio so you can showcase your full design process. In this video, you'll learn how to know if you're ready to convert your paper wireframes to a digital version and the most important elements to focus on as you get started. Let's do it. After you've explored multiple ideas for wireframes on paper and you understand which wireframe elements will provide the best user experience, it's time to bring your paper wireframe to life digitally. While drawing wireframes on paper is fast and inexpensive, things get a little trickier when we move to digital wireframes. So make sure you feel good about your paper wireframes before you move on to the next step. There are a few questions you can ask yourself to decide if you're ready to move on to a digital wireframe. One, is my paper wireframe complete? As we know, a wireframe isn't anywhere close to a finished product, so complete means you have an idea of the structure that you want to use in your wireframe. Two, have I received feedback on my paper wireframe? Hopefully by this point, you've received feedback from peers or your manager on your wireframes. And three, am I ready to consider basic visual cues? Remember, color and images don't come into play until much later. But at this point in the design process, you might vary the kind of text you include in your wireframes. We'll discuss this more soon. If you can answer yes to these three questions, you're probably ready to transition from a paper wireframe to a digital wireframe. If not, that's OK. Keep working on your paper wireframes until they meet this criteria. As you move forward with your wireframes and make the transition from paper to digital, there are a few things you should keep in mind. First, use actual content for important pieces of text instead of all placeholder text. For example, for different sections of the screen, I might want to call out what that section is called. In the dog walking app, right above the list of dog walkers, I'll write out available dog walkers near you to make that clear. Another example is, in a bottom bar, you might list the actual text label below the icons to make it clear what each icon will do. But for large chunks of body copy, use a placeholder text like lorem ipsum. If you're not familiar with it, lorem ipsum is meaningless placeholder text written in Latin that you can use to show where content will go and how a page will be laid out. The use of Latin text to simulate words without actual meaning started in the printing industry, where it was used to lay out a printed page before the real text had been written. The 69-word lorem ipsum text block originally appeared in an ethics book written in 45 BC by the Roman scholar Cicero, and it was first used for fake text 
in the 1960s. While manual printing is pretty much extinct, designers still rely on lorem ipsum to simulate text in a layout. Using lorem ipsum allows designers to present the structure of the wireframe without the distraction of actual words. You'll see lorem ipsum used a lot and will use it frequently yourself throughout your UX design career. The second thing to keep in mind when transitioning from paper to digital wireframes is that you should hold back on adding expressive content like color or images into your wireframe for now. Your wireframe should still focus on functionality. Wait until you start working on prototypes before adding expressive visual details. So why do UX designers create wireframes digitally? Digital wireframes allow you to pay more attention to the details. The goal of paper wireframes was to get all of your ideas out on paper, and it was okay to be messy. But now with digital wireframes, it's important to get the structure right, and that means making your design cleaner. Digital wireframes are also easier to share than paper wireframes because many digital tools, like the ones we'll use, allow you to collaborate. Sharing a link to your digital design is a lot easier than making photocopies and mailing them to each of your stakeholders. All right, using what you just learned, you should be able to get your paper wireframes in a good enough state that you're ready to start translating them into a digital format. And coming up, we'll do that as we transition from a paper wireframe to a digital wireframe in Figma. Keep up the great work. You've learned so much about the UX design process so far. You've created some basic wireframes and explored different elements that go into planning your design. Now's a great time to switch over and learn the ins and outs of a UX design tool. This way, you get a feel of what it's like to build a project. In the next video, you'll learn to use an innovative UI and UX design tool called Figma. There are many applications and tools out there to help you achieve your wireframing and design goals. So what makes Figma special? Figma simplifies the design process by allowing teams to collaborate, even if they're not in the same location. And that's appreciated by designers who work remotely or for teams where individuals are located in different parts of the world. Imagine you're collaborating with the designer on the other side of the globe. You're on a tight deadline to have the project completed. Working together on a cloud-based app speeds up the process, making it ideal for collaboration and time management. I've personally used Figma a lot for remote work because Figma enables a very collaborative environment. My team runs a good amount of workshops with other teams around the company, and oftentimes, many of the participants are based in different locations. Figma's collaborative features have made it possible for us to continue doing workshops, even though we may not physically be in the same room. Figma is widely used by the design community, so there are many plugins made available by the design community to help speed up the design process. Figma is considered an all-in-one tool because designers can create wireframes and prototypes, which we'll explore later. Even though we'll be working in Figma for this part of the certificate, it's important to remember that many of the skills we'll explore are transferable to other UX design tools too. Remember, UX design changes often, and so do UX design tools. Once you know the basics in one tool, like Figma, you'll be able to master a new tool in no time. Coming up, you'll learn how to create a Figma account, build digital wireframes in Figma, and understand how to present your new digital wireframes. Figma is a vector design tool that runs in the browser. Use Figma to brainstorm ideas, iterate on designs, create prototypes, and get feedback at any stage of the creative process. In this beginner's course, we're going to take you through the key stages of designing an app in Figma, from the initial wireframes to an interactive prototype. We'll cover the basics and introduce more powerful features like auto layout, components, and prototyping. There's something for everyone, whether you're new to design or new to Figma. We won't cover all these features in depth, but we'll provide you with resources to continue your Figma education. 
Sign up for a free Figma account at figma.com. With the Figma account, you can create teams, shared workspaces, where you can collaborate on files and organize them in projects. Choose from a free starter team or a paid professional team. If you are a student or educator, you can get access to all of Figma's professional features for free. Visit figma.com slash education slash apply to verify your education account. Once you've created your team, you can invite members to collaborate. This will give them access to all the projects and files in your team. You can choose what level of access each team member has. Learn more about creating teams and inviting members by searching Teams in the Figma Help Center. We're pretty sure we've got the next million dollar idea, a social media app for pets. We want some feedback on the general layout before we start exploring specific elements of our design. Wireframes are simplified designs that are devoid of any style, like color, type, or imagery. They allow us to map out user flows and explore different ways we structure our app without having to design any elements or add any content. We start our journey in the Figma editor. The canvas is the backdrop for all of your designs. It's where you'll add all the frames, shape, text, and images. There are no bounds to your creativity, but you should know that the canvas extends approximately 65,000 points in each direction. With the great expanse that is the canvas, we need something to put our designs in. Enter frames. Frames are the containers we place our shape, text, and image layers in. You can think of each frame in the canvas as a single screen of your design. The toolbar contains the tools we need for creating layers. Select the frame tool in the toolbar. Frame presets in the sidebar on the right let us create frames with specific dimensions. We know that we're making a mobile app, so we'll select Google Pixel 2 XL from the presets. Two exciting things just happened. Figma added a frame to our canvas, and the sidebar on the left is no longer empty. Everything that we add to the canvas will also be added to the Layers panel. Let's right-click on this frame and name it to Home. To explore more of the canvas, we can use two fingers on a trackpad or the scroll on the mouse wheel to pan around. We can also press and hold the spacebar and click and drag to pan. Let's zoom out so we can see the entire frame. If you're using the trackpad, you can also use the pinch gestures to zoom in and out. You can also use shortcuts like Command Plus and Command Minus to zoom in or out. For granular control, adjust the zoom level in your view settings up here. Now we're ready to add some layers to our frame. As this is a wireframe, we're going to keep it basic and use shapes like rectangles and ellipses to represent more complex aspects of our designs. We'll select the Rectangle tool to create an image for a post on our app's homepage. Just like frames, every layer in the canvas has dimensions. We can adjust a layer's position and dimensions at the top of the right side bar. We want our rectangle to take up most of the horizontal space in our frame, so let's make the width of our rectangle 380 and a height of 300. If we look in the Layers panel again, we can see that our rectangle is within our home frame. Some layers, like frames, can contain other layers. If we move our rectangle outside of the frame, the Layers panel updates too. We're going to place our rectangle back inside of our frame. Figma will help us snap the position of the rectangle to align it to the center of the frame. Cool. Now we're going to create a shape that represents a user's profile picture or avatar. Select the ellipse tool in the menu and click to start drawing the ellipse. If you hold down shift as we drag, we can create a perfect circle. We'll release to create the avatar with dimensions of around 30 by 30. Holding shift can strain the proportions of our ellipse. If we update one value in the right side bar, the other will update too. We can click into the width field and use the arrow keys to nudge the ellipse's dimensions to 30. Some fields in Figma accept equations. We can use equations to resize layers by adding, subtracting, multiplying, or dividing the existing value. Let's add plus 10 to the field to set the dimensions of our circle to 40. 
basic shapes support both fill and stroke properties. We can see these in the right side bar when we select both of our layers. By default, our layers have a fill of gray, but you can choose another color. Enter a hex code in the field, or click the swatch to open the color picker. We can select colors from the palette, or apply other fills like gradients, images, and even animated GIFs. We can also remove the fill entirely by clicking the minus button. We want our wireframes to appear like outlines instead of solid shapes. We can do this by adding a stroke. Strokes are outlines or borders around layers. We've learned to align layers to their frames, but we can also align objects to each other. Let's use the alignment tools to align the layers to the left. As our avatar layer is smaller, Figma will align it to the larger image layer. Now, we need a username to go with our avatar. Select the text tool, click a spot on the canvas next to our avatar, and type in name. We'll cover adjusting text properties later in the series. We want our text layer to align to the center of our avatar. Drag over multiple layers to select them all at once, and click Align Vertical Center. If we want to make small adjustments to a layer's position, we can use our arrow keys to nudge objects on the canvas. Looks good to me. Users will want to engage with each other by commenting, liking, and saving posts. Let's press R to select the rectangle tool and create some icons for these actions. We'll use Shift again to constrain the proportions and create a perfect square. Let's aim for dimensions of 32 by 32. Instead of drawing three separate squares, we can copy the original layer. There are a few ways to copy layers. Hold down Alt or Option and click and drag on our layers to duplicate it. Or press Command D. Figma will maintain the same distance between objects. If we want to change the uniform spacing between them, we can select our layers and update the horizontal spacing in the right side bar. We'll need some text below our image. Let's add that. All these layers make up a single post. We want to be sure these objects stay together. There are two ways we can group layers. We can use the keyboard shortcut Command G to create a group out of these layers. Groups allow us to move a collection of layers around without having to select each individual layer. We can use groups or frames to organize our layers panel. While frames and groups look similarly in the layers panel, they are fundamentally different. Groups are the sum of their parts and have no properties of their own. We can use groups to organize our layers or apply properties to layers in bulk. Frames, on the other hand, can have their own dimensions and properties, some of which can affect the layers within them. We'll learn more about frames and their properties later in this series. From the right side bar, we can convert our group into a frame. Then, we'll copy this frame using the keyboard shortcut to create a second post for our feed. We'll move the other post below the other post in the frame. The feed is starting to take shape, but we're missing some crucial elements to make it look like an app. We need a status bar and a navigation menu to move between pages in our app. We could make these elements using shapes, or we could rely on components and libraries to speed up the process. Components are the building blocks of our designs. They can be basic UI elements like buttons or icons, or more elaborate compositions like toolbars and menus. Libraries are collections of components and styles. You can use libraries in Figma to create, share, and use components across your files. You might have heard of a design system. Design systems combine component libraries with standards and guidelines for implementing them in code. They're a single source of truth for designers and developers and help to create consistency at scale. Let's look for a component library in the Figma community. The Figma community is a space where creators can share resources in the form of design files and plugins. We're going to use this wireframe UI kit, so we'll duplicate the file and add it to our drafts. We could copy components from this file and paste them into our wireframes. We're going to publish these components to a library instead to make them available to our team. We'll open the file in the editor and click the arrow next to the file name and select Move to Project. As components can only be published in a team, we'll move this to a project in our team. Now, we can go to the same menu and select Publish Components and Styles. 
we can enter a description of our library and press Publish to share it to our team. Back in our original file, we can now access that library in the Assets panel of the left sidebar. Click the Book icon to open the library's modal. Toggle the switch to enable the wireframe in our file. Let's resize the left sidebar. Hover over the edge until the cursor appears, then click and drag to resize. OK, we need components to represent the status bar at the top of the screen and a floating action button, or fab, at the bottom. This generic status bar is perfect. To add this component to our file, we can click on the component in the Assets panel and drag it onto the canvas. We'll position the status bar near the top of the frame and release to place. We'll align to the top and left. Let's repeat this process for the fab and place it in the bottom and the right of the frame. Now we have copies of these components, known as instances. Instances are connected to the main component they originated from. If you make a change to the main component, Figma will also apply those changes to any instances. This saves you from having to manually update every instance when you want to change properties of your component. Our eventual application will need to adapt to different screen sizes. If we want to resize our frame now, our components don't change. We can make sure they respond to different frame sizes using constraints. At the moment, our constraints are set to the top and left by default. We want the status bar to take up the full width of the frame. So we'll keep the vertical constraints at top and set our horizontal constraints to left and right. We'll set the constraints for the fab at the bottom and right. Now, when we resize our frame, the components will respond according to their constraints. Our app is starting to come together. Let's create a frame for our menu. Select the frame in the toolbar or press the F key. We'll add another Google Pixel 2XL preset to the canvas. Let's add some text layers for each page in our app. Press T to select the text tool and click to create a new text layer. We'll type in menu item for now. We want all our text layers to be the same width, so we'll set the width to 200. We'll also increase the font size to 20. Let's duplicate this layer to create four more menu items, one for each page in our app. Hold down Alt slash Option, then click and drag to duplicate. Then, use the duplicate shortcut. Let's copy the status bar and fab from our home page to complete our menu page. We'll click to select the status bar, hold down Shift, then click to select the fab. We'll then use the shortcut Command C to copy them to our clipboard. Select our menu frame, and press Command V to paste. Figma paste them in the same position as this frame. Nice. I think there are some other ways we could lay out this menu page, so let's explore some different approaches. Okay, we have a few designs here, but I'm not quite sure which approach to take. We could set up a design critique and schedule some time on the calendar, but I wonder if anyone on the team is around to help me choose. We'll click the share button in the toolbar. As we've already invited everyone on our team, we don't have to invite them to every file. We'll click copy link and drop the link in our team channel. Our team has some existing sticky note components, which we love to use for feedback. I'll enable that library in this file while I'm waiting for our team to arrive. Our team members avatars are showing up in the toolbar. To jump to their location on the canvas, we can click on their avatar to enter observation mode. It sounds like our team loved the simplicity of our first design, but thought that a back button would be better than our fab. Someone suggested the menu could be underneath the rest of our content. I like that idea. Another person pointed out that the centered text makes it hard for users to scan quickly. That's a great point. It looks like fellow design intern Daniel is creating a new version of the menu, which incorporates some elements of each of our designs. This looks awesome, and everyone's on the same page. I'm glad we got some feedback on our wireframes before we invested in some higher fidelity designs. Now we know which direction to go in. We'll see you in our next video where we explore color, typography, and imagery. Now that you understand the basics of wireframing and have been introduced to Figma, 
we're going to put these two things together. So far, you've drawn wireframes on paper, but now let's go digital. In this video, you'll learn how to transition the wireframes you've drawn on paper into digital wireframes using Figma. So, let's open Figma. I'll start by adding pictures of my paper wireframes to the Figma dashboard. I took photos of my sketches already, so I'll upload them now. From the menu, click File, then Place Image. Let me find where I saved my paper wireframe photos on my computer. Found them. Now that I've located them, I can upload them to Figma. Another way to upload the photos is to drag them from a folder and drop them into Figma. Let me demonstrate it for you now. There, now I have something to reference as I build a digital wireframe. Next, I'll build the frame. On the toolbar, I'll click this icon that looks like a hashtag. It's called a frame icon in Figma. Then I'll select the platform I want to use. You can create a wireframe for any type of platform. Since I'm demonstrating how to build a mobile app, I'll choose a phone as the frame. I'll pick Android. Seeing the long rectangle makes it much easier to visualize the phone screen. To make it easier for me to reference, I've moved the home screen sketch next to the Android frame. Now, I'm ready to create the bar at the top of the screen. To do that, I'll need to create another rectangle. I'll open the Shapes menu in the toolbar, where there are a variety of shapes to choose from. I'll select this rectangle. Then, I'll draw the rectangle in the frame across the top to create the bar. Next, I need to create the navigation icon, which is usually three horizontal lines. To do this, I'll draw a line. I need the Shapes menu again for this one. The navigation icon will be in the top left corner of the app. So, let's draw the first line. Oops, that doesn't look very straight, does it? I'm going to delete that by selecting it and using the delete key on my keyboard. Here's a pro tip. To create a perfectly straight line, instead of drawing it freehand like I just did, you need to hold down the shift key on your keyboard as you draw. There, that's better. Instead of drawing two more lines, I'll copy this one. I'll select the line by clicking on it, then use the keyboard shortcut to copy it. On a Mac, hold down the Command button, then press C. On a PC, hold down the Control button, then press C. Now that I've copied the line, it's time to paste it. I'll use a shortcut again. This time for paste, you can press Command V or Control V. It seems like the second line pasted right on top of the original line, so you might not be able to see it. But I can use my keyboard arrows or my mouse to move the new line. I'll put the new line directly below the original line. Now, I'll make another copy and position this third line directly under the previous one. Do you notice how when I move the line I drew, red lines appear in the frame? Those are guiding lines to help line up the shapes. That way, when you have a group of lines or shapes, none of them are too far to the left or to the right. Great, now let's go back to our hand-drawn wireframe. The next feature on the bar is the company logo. Remember, for wireframes, we want to keep this simple. So I'm going to create another rectangle to act as the placeholder for the logo. Now, let's fill the rectangle in with a new color to show that it's a placeholder for something else and to provide contrast with the bar. First, I'll select the shape. Then in the design menu, I'll choose the color. Since this is a wireframe, I'll just use a darker gray. Great, so we have the bar at the top of the app and a spot for the logo. The last element that'll be in this bar is the profile icon. To make the profile icon, I'll use the shapes menu again and select a circle. Remember how I held down the shift key to draw a straight line? I'll also hold down the shift key to draw a perfect circle. Let's make this dark gray too. 
To make the circle seem like a person, I'll add a smaller circle for the head of the person. I'll make this circle light gray for contrast. To make the body, a stick figure will do. I can use a few lines for this one. First, a straight line for the body. Then, for the arms, let's use diagonal lines. The shift key trick won't work for diagonal lines, but that's okay. I'll just draw these two lines as straight as I can. You'll notice that I made those lines gray as well. So now I have the bar at the top of the app. Great. The next thing I need to create is the image carousel at the top of the page. An image carousel allows me to show rotating features in the app. To represent the carousel, I'll make a large rectangle. Just like in my paper wireframe, I'll draw an X through the rectangle to show that this will be an image once we get to the hi-fi stage. I'll choose a light gray for the X so it somewhat fades into the background. Next, to show that this is a carousel and the content will change, I need to create something that shows there are multiple pages. We call this a pagination indicator. On our paper wireframe, I used an ellipsis, so I'll do the same here. First, I'll draw a very small circle. And as a reminder, I'm holding down my shift key as I draw. There, now I'll fill the circle in a black color for contrast. Next, I'll make two copies of the small circle. I'll put the three circles in a line and place them in the middle of the rectangle at the bottom. Now, I'll line them up using the built-in guides. Together, these three dots show that the image and content will rotate on the carousel. Perfect. Next, let's write some copy. As a reminder, the only copy you should include in a wireframe are words that help people understand the function of a button or section. To do that, I need to create a text box. I'll click the text icon, then I'll draw a box where I want the text to appear. The blinking cursor indicates where I can type. I'm going to write latest tips to train your dog. This kind of title is important to explain what the rectangle represents. Although wireframes don't have a lot of text, it's a good idea to use some copy here and there because real text helps ground you in the design. If I just use placeholder text like lorem ipsum here, the purpose of this carousel wouldn't be clear. Now, we need to adjust the size of the text using the design menu. I'll make this 24 point font. Finally, let's enter the text in the carousel so it's visually appealing. Let's use the guides to center the text. Great, now that's done. I'll add the schedule button next. Since schedule is the call to action or the button I most want users to click, I'll make the button big and obvious. I'll draw a big rectangle and write schedule in the middle. I'll do this a bit faster now that you're getting the hang of the process. Now I have more than half the wireframe completed. The last section I want to create is the list of dog walkers that will automatically populate at the bottom of the screen based on the user's location. So first, I'll add another text box. I want another simple title here to explain the function of this section of the wireframe. I'll use dog walkers near you, and I'll adjust the font size to 24 again so it's consistent with the title above. Next, I need to create the profiles for each dog walker. The profiles need to be divided into sections, so I'll create some dividers. To create dividers, I'm going to draw a straight line that fills most of the length of the screen. You'll see this line is drawn in black, which fits the style that we've been using. 
Now, I'll make a copy of this line and move it a little ways underneath the first line to allow space for the dog walker's profiles. Great, I'm going to select both of these lines and make two more copies. Now I'll paste them in equal distance from the original two lines. This is a pro tip. Copying and pasting multiple items at a time makes the wireframing process faster. Earlier, I used Figma's guiding lines to line up each element, but when I have a bunch of elements like this group of lines here, I can use other techniques. In the design panel, I'll first click on Align to the left. This makes all of my lines start at the same point on the left. Next, I want to have the same amount of space between each line, so I'm going to click on Distribute Vertical Spacing in the design panel. Ta-da! Beautiful, evenly spaced lines. It may seem like a small detail, but it can really give your wireframes a cleaner look. Okay, next, let's show some profiles. I'm going to use a circle to represent a profile photo, just like we did for the user account. Then, I'll add lines to show that there's some text here. Holding down my shift key again, I'll draw one line. I'll make it a bit wider by going into the design panel and changing the stroke. I'll make the stroke 5, which is a thicker line. The stroke was previously 1, which is a thinner line. Wide lines typically indicate text in wireframes. Narrower lines are meant to show divisions, another small detail that conveys a lot of information. Next, I'll copy this wide line and paste it underneath the first one. I'm going to make this one longer than the first one. Just a minor thing like different line lengths can convey a lot of information. The top line is shorter since this will be the dog walker's name. Then the line underneath is longer because it'll have additional information about these dog walkers. These kinds of details will feel more automatic to you the more wireframes you build. Now we want to fill in the boxes we created with the dividing lines with more profiles of dog walkers. First, I'll make a copy of this group of design elements. I'll do that by selecting the avatar with the lines, then using Command-C, then Command-V, or Control-C, then Control-V on the keyboard. This will make a copy of the group of elements right on top of the existing group. Then I'll drag this set of elements I just copied and pasted down lower in the frame. I can use the arrow keys so that the new elements move. I'm going to follow the guiding lines to make sure they line up correctly. All right. The wireframe for the dog walking app's homepage is done. I think it's looking great. Coming up, you're going to be transferring your own paper sketches into digital wireframes. You should be really well prepared at this point. As you practice using Figma or any other digital tool, you'll get a lot faster, and digital wireframing will be almost as quick as sketching on paper. Of course, any time you get stuck, come back to this video or look up the tutorials Figma has on their website. There are plenty of resources to help you as you get more comfortable with the tool. Good luck! Have you ever looked at an app and found that your eyes are drawn to a certain spot of the screen? That's because design principles are actually happening behind the scenes. We know our eyes are being drawn to something, but we may not be able to easily articulate how that's being done exactly. You know how to create basic wireframes of an app, so it's time to learn a few principles to make your designs even more usable and intuitive. In this video, we'll explore the concept of the Gestalt principles. There are a few Gestalt principles that you can commonly apply to your wireframes, like similarity, proximity, and common region. Keep in mind, there are more Gestalt principles beyond these three. To get things started, let's define Gestalt principles. Gestalt principles describe how humans group similar elements, recognize patterns, and simplify complex images when we perceive objects. You can use the principles to organize content on apps and websites so it's visually pleasing and easier to understand. Basically, humans naturally notice the whole of something before noticing the parts. Gestalt principles got their name from the word gestalt which is a German word that means shape or form. 
Have you ever looked at the clouds and tried to find shapes within them? You might have spotted a cloud that loosely resembled an animal or a familiar object. That's an example of Gestalt principles at work. We unconsciously connect different elements in a scene to quickly understand them. In short, our brains are designed to make meaning at a glance. Let's examine one of the Gestalt principles, similarity. This principle means that elements that look similar are perceived to have the same function. Elements might look similar based on their shape, size, or color. One example of this is links within a web page. They're almost always the same color, blue. This leads us to think that their function is similar too. Let's look at an example of how similarity comes into play in wireframes. Earlier, we worked on a wireframe of Google Photos. If you look closely, you'll notice that the bottom half of the app contains six squares that are the same size. Because they all have the same shape and size, you perceive these elements as being similar or peers in a group. In this case, each square represents a photo, and the function of each square is the same. If you tap on the square, it will enlarge to fill the full screen. Here's the takeaway. When designing a wireframe, consider making elements that have a similar function look similar to give your app a more intuitive user experience. Now let's examine another Gestalt principle, proximity. This principle states that elements that are close together appear to be more related than things that are spaced farther apart. How does this play out in our Google Photos wireframe? At the top of the wireframe, there are three large rectangles placed close together in a row. Because the rectangles are close together, our brains think they're related. It turns out our brain is correct. These three rectangles are photo albums, while the six squares below, which are placed more distantly from those rectangles, are just individual photos. Here's the takeaway. When designing your wireframe, put elements that are related close together instead of far apart. Great. Now you're getting the hang of this. Let's examine one more principle, common region. This principle states that elements located within the same area are perceived to be grouped together. Let's think about this principle in our Gmail wireframe. The divider line creates a border around each email. So the subject line, email recipients, and email content appear to be grouped together. Here's the takeaway. You can use borders in your wireframes to group elements together. Great. Now you know some of the most commonly used Gestalt principles. Similarity, proximity, and common region. Keep these principles in mind as you create your wireframes and your products will be easier to use. Congratulations on finishing this course from the Google UX Design Certificate. You can access the full experience including job search help and start to earn your certificate by clicking on the icon or the link in the description below. Watch the next video in the course by clicking here and subscribe to our channel for more from upcoming Google Career Certificates.